It's time we give back. Someone we'll see and show someone where the love's at. Even if you don't give a damn, give your heart and share your time. Help somebody else in life. Give back. Let's give back. Hello, my name is Hosea James Gavin II, and welcome to this episode of Ignite, Empower, Transform. Today, we're going to take a look at race relations. My guests are Debbie Phillips and Adrian Deering. Here we go. Debbie, Adrian, thanks for joining us. Yeah. How are you guys thanks doing? Thanks for having us. Thank we're you. Doing. My pleasure. Okay, so, so Debbie is, uh, is with us from Long Island. She's from Syosset, Long Island, and we have Adrian who's from West Virginia, okay? So what I'd like for you guys to do is just, uh, we're dealing uh, in this country right now, uh, and we were talking offline about how divided this country is right now, right? And how there's so much tension and so much anxiety and stress. And uh, the reason that I've asked you to join us is because basically, uh, you guys come from two different worlds, right? Yes. Two completely different worlds. And you can give us, a, I feel, realistic perspectives based on your reality from your worlds, right? And I think it's important for us to have cross dialogue and conversations and open an openness to hearing different perspectives and, and gaining greater insight so we can better understand each other and some of the challenges that we face, right? And as, when I say we, I'm talking about the big we, and you know, I'm talking about the United Society. States as the sure. country, right? So uh, Adrian, I'm gonna ask for you to go first. Okay, um, again, my name is Adrienne Daring. I live in Morgantown, West Virginia, which is a small, college town and West Virginia is in fact a separate state for Virginia so don't ask me if I've been to Richmond. <laughs> um, I grew up in central Florida um, about two blocks from what was then the Orlando Naval Training Center. Um, I uh, grew up uh, my daddy was a Sears repairman and my mother ran an upscale retail store. Um, I've lived in Orlando. I've lived in Atlanta. I've lived in Washington, D.C., and I've lived in West Virginia for the last eight years. And living here has given me a greater understanding of middle America than I would have had otherwise from growing up in fairly large cities on the East Coast. Right, right. Hey, Deb. So my name is Debbie Phillips. I am a public school teacher here in Queens, New York. Um, I have grown up here on Long Island my whole life. Um, I have been blessed with an amazingly supportive family. And I recently, recently is the wrong word. My eyes have been open very wide over the last 12 months about what we are dealing with here in our country and all of the injustices that are going on. Incidentally, I wanted to add one other little thing. I did go to college at University of Maryland in College Park for two years. So I spent quite a bit of time in DC on the weekends. Um, so I had a brief um, overlap with you. Uh, as far as that geographical city. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so you kind of touched on it, Deb. Um, we are, as you, as you alluded to, uh, over the last year, uh, we've been dealing with a lot, right? And particularly in 2020, uh, we have really, really uh, been dealing with a lot from, from Kobe Bryant till, till now, and, and now we're talking mid-June. Uh, it's it's just been unprecedented in my lifetime. And uh, I grew up in the, in, during the turbulent 70s. And I know, and I, uh, I remember uh, the conflict on a daily basis uh, that you would see on TV, the, the demonstrations, um, the anti-war protest, and um, um, some 
aspects of uh, the later part of the Black Power movement. Um, I, I, I vividly remember those times, but it does not compare uh, to what we're, what we're uh, dealing with now. Uh, we, we, we're, we're dealing with a, a pandemic uh, a situation, uh, but upon that, in addition to that, uh, we're dealing with uh, racial tension in this country that uh, I haven't seen, you know, in, in my lifetime, uh, where it's been this intense, where I'm, I'm consciously aware uh, that it's this intense. Uh, and I'm concerned, and I'm concerned. And, and, and I think part of the reason why we have uh, many of the conflicts is because we don't have an open dialogue, and we don't have an exchange of ideas, and we're not trying to uh, understand different perspectives. And I think uh, it's important that we, we do uh, have this kind of conversation uh, where you do get different perspectives, right? Uh, Debbie, you talked about your family coming, uh, your, your family background and, and, mm -hmm. and your family history and, and share with, with us, uh, the audience, uh, your, your, your grandmother uh, okay. shared some things with you that I feel would be beneficial uh, for, our, for, our, for our listening audience. Thank you. Um, so on my mother's side of the family, my grandmother was born and raised in Poland, and my grandfather was raised in a city right outside of Moscow, Russia. Um, thankfully, they came here between 1900 and 1910, so they were here long before World War II. Um, had they not come with their families, they I might not be sitting here. Um, but back to Jose's question with regards to my grandmother, um, from a very, very young age, my grandparents lived in Flushing, Queens, which is a, a, a pretty large city within New York City, um, and uh, very multicultural. Um, but my grandmother would take me for walks on the main streets and she impressed upon me how important it was to treat every human being with respect regardless of their skin tone, regardless of the language that they spoke, regardless of the religion that they practice. Uh, my grandmother instilled in me something called chesed, which is kindness and compassion. Um, and it's such a big part of who I am today that I, I will never forget all of what she has taught me. And my grandfather too, he taught me quite a lot as well, but he was working, you know, every day. So I spent a lot more time with my grandmother and she made me into the woman I am today, gratefully. Amen. That's fantastic. And, and Adrian, you and I have, uh, via Facebook, uh, we've been having uh, online conversations and, and I know uh, you being a parent, uh, basically have, exp had, have expressed pretty much the same thing based on uh, what you had shared with me uh, to your children that your that Deborah's grandmother shared with her, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely, and I um, I also grew up in a household where um, you can't escape the rainbow in Central Florida. I, I mean, especially being close to a Navy base, the na the military is so diverse, um, and um, I, my mother lived, my mother's mother was a waitress in Gary, Indiana. My mom grew up poor in a basement apartment. Hold on, yeah. not to interrupt you, but that's exactly where my father's from, Gary, Indiana. <laughs> wow. So um, my mother had a very um, rough childhood in a very diverse city, Gary, Indiana. Wow. And um, my dad had a very, although my dad um, ended up not going to college and kind of ended up being a blue collar guy, had a very um, genteel pedigree, let's say. So I had parents with two very different cultural and um, life experiences growing up. Mm -hmm. um, my mother would have washed my mouth out with soap if I had used a racial slur. I mean, it wasn't something that was allowable in my home growing Thank up. Um, but I am listening now to the experiences um, 
of other people of what's going on now that don't match what I see every day here in Morgantown, West Virginia. And um, I'm, I really want to listen and hear what your experience is so that I can, I can hear you. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take a, a, a quick uh, public service announcement break. And then on the other end of this uh, public service announcement break, then we'll we'll get into like hearing and sharing. All right, sounds good. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll be right back. Thank you. You got a king? Go fish! Save your face! Save your face! It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Okay, uh, welcome back to this segment of Ignite and Power Transform. Uh, we are here with uh, two very special people, uh, Adrian Deering and Debbie Phillips. Uh, thank you for that first segment. Uh, uh, very, very touching on um, both uh, perspectives that you gave. Uh, I think that, uh, Adrian, you kind of uh, left us in the last segment uh, with your desire to kind of get some insight, you know, in terms of just you want to Absolutely. hear. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little perspective from a black male perspective, right, okay. in terms of uh, kind of how I see things today. Um, uh, we've had uh, a, a, a series of of different uh, incidents, uh, two in Atlanta, uh, one in Minneapolis, and uh, one in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where uh, black lives were were taken. Right. Um, I've been marching and protesting and demonstrating um, since I was in my twenties. Uh, I'm, I'm a few years past that. I remember when uh, uh, in Howard Beach. Uh, Michael Griffin was chased uh, down a major thoroughfare uh, in Howard Beach into the Belt Parkway uh, where, he was, where he was murdered. I remember when Yusef Hawkins uh, was, was, I marched uh, when Yusef Hawkins was killed in Bensonhurst. Uh, when Amadou Diallo was, was uh, shot 41 times, shot at 41 times, 19 minutes, bullets striking him from a police officer. Uh, I, I protested and was arrested uh, uh, protesting the brutality of that act. Uh, so uh, the times that we're in, it seems like it's been like as long as I could remember we've been dealing with this. Uh, I personally am committed uh, to uplifting my, our children in, in trying to instill in them uh, a sense of uh, responsibility to take over when it's their time, right? But it's important that they understand uh, that sense of, of history, all right? And that sense of history in terms of understanding how far back this goes. This, this didn't start in 1960. Uh, no. It didn't start in 1950. Uh, no. It's been pretty much like this from the inception of this country from, I guess, the pilgrims, you know, where a certain, a certain power structure was in place, right? And the, con the concept of hatred is biblical, so it's been an even longer than that. Right, right, right. But as, 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 as we evolve as, as a nation, as we evolve as a people, um, we're, uh, I think, I think we're getting a taste of that power. And, 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 and we got a taste of that power m most recently uh, when President Obama was elected as president, right? That was, for, I never thought I'd experience anything like that in my lifetime, where we would see a black president, right? But it also, I think shook the power, uh, uh, the elite, the power base, where now they feel a little more threatened 
in terms of sure. in terms of being able to maintain the power, right? And so a lot of the reactions that we're seeing right now, I believe, is connected to wanting to maintain that power. And so when we see the police brutality, uh, in some cases, and, and again, I have many friends who are police officers, good guys, black, white, Hispanic, yeah. male, female, good guys. And I think the lion's share are, right? But, but there are, uh, within, that, within the police force, there are members of that group that should not be there and don't have the proper mindset uh, to, to really deal with diversity, right? And are still caught up in that maintenance of power, maintaining the power, right? So that sense of threat can play out even on the street level. So I, I think that I, um, I actually have, during COVID-19, um, trying to make myself feel better, I've been reading a humorist named Jen Lancaster. And she's a Gen Xer who lives in Chicago, Illinois. And she, in one of her little memoirs, chronicles riding around with the policemen of her little Lake Forest suburb, which is an affluent white suburb for the most part. And discussing policemen being warriors or guardians. And I think that first of all, we don't pay our policemen enough to get the best sometimes. Um, and that's, that is a problem. Um, we're paying people $15 an hour here in West Virginia to risk their life every day. And I don't think that you get the best people for that, right? I mean, I, I think that that's a legitimate. Can you, can you back up a, a quick second? Uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure if I heard that correctly. You're saying police officers are getting paid $15 an hour? Yes, I am saying that. That's minimum wage. The policemen in my town make $30,000 a year to start out with. That's, yeah, that's, that is a concern. Right. And, and I think that um, maybe the mindset of the people training them has been more gung-ho warrior than it has been emphasizing their position as guardians. I thought that was a really, those two words were to me very powerful. The word usage she used, warrior or guardian. Okay. So I think we need more guardians and less warriors. Got you. I yeah, agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So, so, so Deb, uh, you've talked about uh, your experience as a teacher in an inner city community, um, sure. being a, a white Jewish female, uh, working uh, with a, a prim pr primarily a predominantly black population, right? Sure. Uh, sure. I've watched you in the classroom. I know your comfort uh, being around children. Uh, it's 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 important, and I've I've, I've heard it both ways. Uh, instilling certain values in children, right? Because these children grow up to be adults, right? And and yeah these values that we see uh, just didn't surface today, right? Uh, For sure. So, uh, the belief is that things are getting better, right? Each generation is becoming more and more tolerant, uh, becoming more and more sensitive, um, but we're not, we're not, we're at, a, we're at a crossroads right now, I think, in history, right? Where we see that the potential, uh, how do we come out of this situation? Do we grow? Do we learn? Um, how, does, how does someone like your husband respond to, uh, and, and I want you to share with our audience a little bit about your husband. How, does he re how could he respond to being supportive in this potential change in terms of mindset that's required for us as a, as a nation, as a, as, a, as a civilization to evolve? Right. So. Um... My, my husband um, grew up the son of a, a small town funeral director and um, made his way up from um, just middle class America to um, a senior executive in a Fortune 500 company. And he um, retired. We, we, we were living in Atlanta and we owned a company in Atlanta. And 
we made the conscious choice to move here to West Virginia to raise our children because we thought Atlanta had too much of a keep up with the Joneses kind of an atmosphere. And we wanted our kids to have a more normal childhood that wasn't so focused on material things, but focused more on the people around them. And Appalachia is very grounding. Um, you, you wanna see your privilege um, live here. Um, my husband is a good man. He's um, definitely um, uh, not um, what I would consider and has never said anything to me that would make me think that he's a bigot or, um, but he fights back against when he feels like he's been attacked, just like everyone does. And they're all looped into one group of people. Um, his experience isn't the same as someone else's, um, and he's just, he's used to unconsciously having always been able to get someone's attention in a restaurant mm -hmm. and to be the authoritative male figure places. Um, it's just who he is. Um, so I think other than electing the old white men out, <laughs> which is what I think I'd like to do. Um, they're not a lost cause, but we need to focus, I think, more on us and our children because we grew up in even more inclusive. We, my, I didn't ever live under segregation. My husband did. He lived in segregated West Virginia. Um, he'll tell you about taking his black friend to the soda fountain and asking for him to sit with them and have a soda and being told they couldn't do that. Um, of course, my experience has never been anything like that. Um, the South I grew up in was, I was born in 1976. Um, but um, I think you just not give up on them, but they're not who we need to focus on because they're on their way out. I agree. So uh, when you say they're on their way out, because of the changing and the dynamics of our country in terms of the population, um, just, just simply uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, we're going to have more Blacks in power, we're going to have more women in power, we're going to have more Hispanics in power, we're going to have you know, uh, more uh, gays in power. I mean, it's just right. the natural order of things in terms of just in, uh, right. you know, Absolutely. But, but what we're seeing is that resistance. Right, a, a, a lot of uh, the tension and a lot of uh, uh, what we're seeing is the result of the reluctance to, uh, and we had this conversation, they're not gonna, no one's gonna give up power, right? right. But it's, it's the viciousness that, that's the concern, right? It's, it's, the, it's the manner uh, and the tone of this country right now is, is just a concern for me. Um, Deborah, people are feeling threatened. People yeah, are Deborah, feeling threatened. But you talked about um, your grandparents um, and their family uh, growing up in in in, Jer in Germany in the third. Uh, no, in Poland and Russia. In Poland, I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay. Well, yeah, but Germany. Uh, it started invaded, in Germany, right? But but Germany invaded Poland, right? And they took yes. over Warsaw, right? Correct. And she, my grandmother, grew up in a um, very small town outside of Warsaw. That was her closest major city. So yeah. Okay, but when I when I when I talk to people uh, from that time, and they compare it to now, they 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 make some they they make parallels between certain things that are that are happening today and certain things that happened then. And that's my concern because the economy is, well, it's, it's tanking right now. It's, it's, in, it's in a bad place. Yeah. Um, and, and that is the root of a lot of these, the issues, right? The economy. Yes. Money. Yes. Absolutely. Or lack, there, or lack thereof. Right. So then everybody starts to think about themselves. It's about self-preservation and how do, how do we, how do we make sure that we, stay on top or how do we make sure that our our people don't Correct. get and, and i think we're it's it's starting to it's starting to happen again and it's and it's that's my concern that's my right. concern how does this play out you know how do we 
how do we prevent something like that happening? And is it already too late? Because <laughs> that's I'm almost concerned about that. Is it already I, too late? I'm not because I, I mean, you have a daughter and I have a daughter. Never too late, right? And we're raising good babies, and I'm raising good sons, and um, I have to think that what I'm doing the most important thing I'm doing is being a mother and it's had been my life's work. And, um, I think that what people aren't seeing, and I think you and I discussed this on, on kind of on Facebook, uh, Hosea is how much rednecks have in common with black folks. Right. I mean, there's this disconnect where you're not the same as me, but you really are. I mean, uh, it's, you're economically struggle, struggling. You have drug and opioid crises. You have no economic and job security. Um, you're judged based upon, in, in, our, in Appalachia, your accent, in your case, the color of your skin. Um, and yet these, these two groups of people who I see as having so much in common have such a strong misunderstanding of one another. Right. And, um, you know, my daughter went to a Model United Nations conference in Pennsylvania and they did their, their little trial with all the other kids from around the Northeast. And then they said they were from West Virginia and People were shocked that there were intelligent, educated people in the state of West Virginia. Wow. So I think that um, seeing each other needs to happen a lot more. And I, what I would almost love to see is I'd love to bust a load of kids from your end of the world down here to middle of nowhere Appalachia and sit them down with kids who may have seen five black people in their life. And I mean, I didn't grow up, that's not my experience, but that is a legitimate experience here in Appalachia. For sure. And sit down and put these kids together and have some um, discussion that is led by mediating adults about how they're the same. So I would love to see something like that happen because we're not seeing it. We're thinking that we're so different and the struggles are so the same. Right. This ends part one of the episode. Part two will be next week. And remember, if it's in your heart, do your part. Today's help equals tomorrow's hope. I love our youth. Power to the people.